Bless the Lord, oh my soul, bless. No, and, and the idea is that, you know, I mean, Satan can, tries, to, tries to manipulate people by frightening them. And fear of Satan gives him more control. We've got several people who are not liberated because they're too frightened of Satan. You've got to trust in Jesus. Hi, thanks for tuning in to another video on Armor of God. As always, I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for being here, for your support and contribution, and hopefully you'll always learn something useful for your own spiritual warfare. Anyway, don't forget to be part of our July's giveaway where I'll be giving away three copies of this book. All you have to do is comment on this video. There's a link to the video down in the description box below, so I'll be selecting the three people from the comments written for that video. Now buckle up and let's get right on it. There's a con a few days ago. Someone was asking why exorcisms take too long. When Jesus cast out the demons, it was instantaneous. So why do exorcisms now take such a long time? And for some cases, even years. Well, I made a promise that I'd dig further and share the answer once I found it. For the first part of this video, I'd like to share what Father Carlos Martins has to say about it. Oh, sure. And in fact, most cases involve multiple sessions. Um, you know, uh, the average possession case, right, right, which is the highest form of, uh, of, of demonic activity or of a demonic hold, the average possession case, both with myself and with my colleagues, the other exorcists I know, uh, lasts about a year and a half. And that's with receiving an exorcism every week. So let's say 75 exorcisms. You know, so why does it take so long? Well, because grace isn't cheap. And, it, and if it were to be easy, you know, like God, God, God forgives our sins instantaneously when we go to confession and ask for that forgiveness. So he dispenses a removal of the guilt of the sin. Uh, and he wants to do that immediately upon our, our confessing of them sacramentally. But with regard to exorcism, it involves... Uh, and a choice, a choice that is aberrant. It, it involves an aberration that has given jurisdiction to Satan. And Satan exercises that jurisdiction. And so if God were to make that too cheap, then people would never resolve to get rid of evil out of their lives. Well, I'll just make a pact with the devil here. I'll, I'll curse someone there. I'll engage in, 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 an, in an act of fornication with a prostitute, or I'll, I'll, I'll live out a, a life, a, a clandestine life as uh, an, in, uh, a consumer of internet pornography uh, with impunity. And so if it's just as easy as going in front of a priest and receiving his blessing, or he, he pronounces some magical words out of a book and poof, the devil is gone, then the sacrifice of his son, of God the Father's son, is cheapened by that. Right. So, so when we, and, and you know, people get the devil, they get possessed most often through the committing of one of two actions. One is the dabbling in the occult. So the, these are not by any means the only way that one can get the devil, but these are the two most common. So a, a dabbling in the occult. So uh, the visiting of a fortune teller, um, the the engaging in trying to curse somebody, necromancy, calling forth the dead seances, uh, and so forth, visiting a medium, that kind of thing, uh, use of a Ouija board. That is by far the most common. And why? Because in doing that action, you are violating the first commandment. And how are you doing so? The, the, the commandment that identifies God as the sole deity in our lives. Well, it violates it because it's a replication of the demonic rage, the demonic, the demonic rebellion that Satan and his fallen angels made against God. God constructed the universe with certain predetermined limits. We are limited in our knowledge. We are limited in our power. And so to engage in the occult is an attempt to usurp those limits. Right? It, when, when we visit a fortune teller, we're, we're trying to gain knowledge into that realm that only God knows. Even the demons don't know the future. They can give a pretty good guess at things because of their superior intellect. 
but they don't even they don't know the future. But when we are tricked into thinking that we can know the future and, and try to do so uh, through an, an engagement with the occult, then we are replicating that demonic rebellion. And so in that action, we have made a declaration, I will not serve you, God. I am God. And so that action gives rights. It gives a jurisdiction to the demons to possess. In fact, they can do so through the committing of any mortal sin, right? Any mortal sin gives uh, the demons the right to possess. Why? Well, if you die in the state of mortal sin, you will never see heaven, right? So they've already, they've already gained you for eternity in that state, right? Until you reconcile with the Lord, you belong to them. The second sin, the, the second most common sin by which people... Uh, obtain demons by which demons cling to, to people is is through an aberrant use of the sexual faculty, some kind of uh, sexual perversion, use of pornography, the visiting of a prostitute, adultery, uh, the misuse of our faculty. But it is also important to remember that even after someone is liberated, they can be repossessed again. As Father Vincent Lampert puts it, it's not just a matter of casting the demon out. God has to be invited in. He would even say that casting the demon out is the easy part, but convincing someone that they really need to have that relationship with God that will give them that ongoing protection can be a hard thing to do. They, they can become repossessed. Why, even before I begin to work with somebody, I have to believe that they're sincere. In Luke's Gospel, in chapter 11, it talks about how once a demon has been cast out, it goes and wanders through the arid wasteland, and then coming back and finding a house swept clean, it yeah. goes and finds seven other demons, works in itself. And they come and take up rest into the person. The danger for a person who's been possessed is that the devil knows that he was successful in the past and maybe he can be successful again, which is why it's so important for the person who was possessed to have that desire to have a relationship with God. So it's not just a matter of casting the demon out, God has to be invited in. I would even say that casting the demon out is the easy part. But convincing someone that they really need to have that relationship with God that will give them that ongoing protection can be a hard thing to do because we all know that when we're in a crisis mentality, you know, we'll do and say anything. You know, the old adage, there's no atheist in a foxhole. When the crisis passes, maybe somebody lapses back into old patterns and behaviors mm -hmm. that may have allowed that demon to enter into their life. So again, it's very, very important for the person to either, again, reconnect with their faith or maybe come to God for the very first time. And if people don't express that desire, there are some people over the years I've chosen not to work with, but out of a sense of charity, realizing, yeah, your situation is bad, but it can become seven times worse if you're not truly sincere in wanting to invite God into your life. Now there are some of you Presumably the Protestants who keep on asking why do you Catholics keep on saying turn to Mary in the fight against the devil? She doesn't have any power. Turn to Jesus. What can Mary do? Why are you spreading this lie? And so I've decided to answer that question here, and hopefully it will help with your understanding. The Virgin Mary is first of all a mother, and a very powerful spiritual mother. She is fully united with her son in heaven and seeks to use all of her power to protect her children, who are invited to turn to her in their time of need. St. Louis de Montfort, an 18th century priest who dedicated his whole life to leading souls to Jesus through Mary, wrote about the protection she offers in his book entitled True Devotion to Mary. He compares her to a hen who gathers her brood under her wings, saving them from outside enemies. Mary, the beloved mother of chosen souls, shelters them under her protecting wings as a hen does her chicks. She speaks to them, coming down to their level and accommodating herself to all their weaknesses. To ensure their safety from the awk and vulture, she becomes their escort, surrounding them as an army in battle array. This she does out of the pure love she has for us, especially those who are daily devoted to her. Montfort continues his reflection, thinking about the magnitude of her protecting help. Could anyone surrounded by a well-ordered army of, say, a hundred thousand men fear his enemies? No, and still less would a faithful servant of Mary, protected on all sides by her imperial forces, fear his enemy. This powerful queen of heaven would sooner dispatch millions of angels to help one of her servants than had it said that a single faithful and trusting servant of hers had fallen victim to the malice 
number, and power of his enemies. This simple truth has been confirmed by many throughout the years, especially exorcists. Even the late Father Gabriel Amorth discovered this reality in his dialogues with the devil, where the devil said to him, I am more afraid when you say the Madonna's name, because I am more humiliated by being beaten by a simple creature than by him. Pope Francis related similar words in a homily at St. Mary Major, where the Madonna is at home, the devil does not enter. Where there is the mother, disturbance does not prevail, fear does not win. There's another element that I'd like to share for all the future videos on this channel, is to include a short clip about our faith that's not related to the demons, but just something like this. Let's call it the halftime message. I hope that sounds good. But I'm begging you, I'm begging you, two things, two things I ask of you tonight, and these will make all the difference in your life, that you never stop going to Sunday Mass, and that you never stop going to confession. God will get his way in your life if you never stop doing those with a heart that desires Jesus. That's, that's it, you guys. I'm asking two things. <clears throat> a combined total in one week will take about an hour and 10 minutes. An hour and 10 minutes is all you got to do. And Jesus will get his way in your life. There's freedom there and there's beauty there. I never, I never dreamed where Jesus would take me. <clears throat> Never dreamed the life I would have. And it's the greatest life I could have possibly imagined. And it was all a gift. Now I'd like to share something that Monsignor Stephen Rossetti said about the demons because we always have to remember this. Fear of the evil one gives him more control and in Monsignor's own words, they have several people who are not liberated because they're too frightened of the devil. They often say, well, you know, uh, the, the picture flew off the wall and, and they say, oh my gosh, what should we do? I say, well, put it back. No, and, and the idea is that, you know, I mean, Satan can, tries, to, tries to manipulate people by frightening them. And fear of Satan gives him more control. We've got several people who are not liberated because they're too frightened of Satan. You've got to trust in Jesus. Satan is a dust bunny compared to Jesus. He's nothing. Uh, but he tries to frighten people. And I would say he's a thug. He tries to frighten people. And that's why it's so important to have a strong faith. He said, you know, don't, don't let them bug you too much. The truth is these fallen angels, they do not want to be in heaven. They do not want to be in the presence of God. They've rejected him before. Even with the full knowledge of what awaits them if they rejected God, they still continued with their rebellion. So for any of you who keep on saying that the demons will probably repent one day, I hope this clears it up. And evil. But let me tell you one story that might be interesting. I was interacting with some demons and I looked at one of them and I said, did you make a bad decision rejecting God? And they said, yes. Are you suffering because of it? Yes. I said, would you change your mind if you could? And they said, no. Well, that's the mystery. That's why they're in hell, because they don't want to be in heaven. And another thing that I'd like to address with an insight from Monsignor Rossetti's explanation is what usually happens during an exorcism. I think personally for me, by understanding more about what happens, we can get rid of any misunderstanding, confusion, and most importantly, the fear and tricks of the devil. I think sometimes people got too carried away thinking that the devil is on an equal footing with God, while in reality, he's nothing when compared to God. Uh, demons retain their rank uh, when they fall, of course, because that's the way they're made. And so Lucifer is the top of the top of the food chain. And then there's got a bunch of lieutenants, you know, Beelzebub and, you know, and Lilith and all these uh, lieutenants in hell, Baal. You know, there's a whole bunch of them or his lieutenants. And then and then you go all the way down the, the chain into the, the smaller demons and the minor ones you never heard of. Uh, and they're probably they're, they're un, untold number of billions, probably maybe more trillions, who knows, of, of uh, fallen angels. So, yeah, they retain their their rank. And uh, when we encounter a possessed person, there's someone's in charge. Typically, there's going to be a, a senior demon or higher ranking demon who is who is leading the pack. And unfortunately, if you get one of the bigger ones, like Beelzebub or someone like that, or Baal, uh, you're in for a bigger, a bigger fight. You, it's it's going to be uh, more difficult to, to cast out one of these major uh, lieutenants of hell. You know, the Jesus does, of course, but it's a bit more of a fight. And so another question that comes to mind, since we've been hearing about the rise in terms of requests for exorcisms in recent years, has the devil and his demons become more active in our society today? You know, is it worse today with uh, terms of Satan uh, versus the past? Well, first of all, Satan's always been around. I mean, if you actually talk to people 
uh, even post-Vatican II when there, people didn't talk about it much. But privately, people would, <clears throat> would tell you if some they had problems. So Satan's never gone away. You know, he, he, he didn't he didn't take a vacation. Uh, but uh, today, I think people are more willing to speak about it. is our situations worse today. That's hard to hard to answer that. But I would say, as our uh, practicing of the faith, the Christian faith, Catholic faith, uh, decreases, and as more people do more and more what we call occult stuff, you know, witchcraft and uh, Ouija boards and all that sort of thing, the more you do that, and the less you practice your faith, the more problems you're going to have. And right now in America, for example, more people are practicing witchcraft. I mean, when I grew up, no one did pray. It wasn't even discussed. You know, and now like it's kind of like in, you know, I'm I'm a witch, you know, or or all the tarot cards, all that kind of stuff. That's an invitation. You you do that and uh, you're opening yourself up to problems. And for the last part of this video, before I share the audio clip of Monsignor Rossetti praying for us, I'd like to share Father Vincent Lampert's explanation on the creation of the angels and the goal of demons. What is it that they want from us? Please just a little bit more of your time to listen to this. The creation of the angelic world is really not known. It was St. Augustine, again, who speculated that we can see the creation of the angelic world in the book of Genesis when God says, let there be light. You know, when we think of light, we think of intellect. You know, if you have a great idea, we say, ah, the light came on. You might see a cartoon with a light bulb above somebody's head. So God created, said, let there be light. There was light and it was good. But then immediately the light was separated into day and darkness but the separation wasn't called good. Now, this is the first day of creation. This cannot be the sun or the moon or the stars because in the book of Genesis, they were not created until the third day. So what is this light that God said let there be? So St. Augustine says he believed that it was the creation of the angelic world. And so God created the angels. He gave them this infused knowledge and then basically said to the angels, with all the knowledge I've given you, will you now unite your free will with mine? And then the belief was that Lucifer, the greatest of the angelic creatures, a seraphim angel closest to the throne of God. The word seraphim means the fiery one. So if you're close to God, you're literally on fire for God. It's like getting close to a fire and catching fire yourself. But then Lucifer rejected that notion of glorifying God. And angels in a higher choir and um, influence angels in a lower choir. So when he chose to rebel against God, his rebellion reverberated through the nine choirs of angels, and then one third of them embraced his uh, rejection of God. And then they were cast down to the earth. So that's where let there be light, there was day and darkness. The day would refer to good angels, the darkness to the bad angels who were expelled from heaven. And ultimately the goal of the devil would be for humanity to make the same choice that he himself has made, namely the complete rejection of God. You know, angelic creatures cannot repent. Sometimes people wonder, could the devil ever say, I'm sorry? And in reality, the, the answer is no, because it would not even occur to the devil to say that. And it's because of their angelic nature. Again, when angels were created, they're in the presence of all that they can know. So the devil knew before the fall that one of the consequences of him saying no to God was eternal damnation. And yet even with that knowledge, he chose it anyway. So a, de a demon could never say, I didn't know that. A human person can. We can grow in our understanding and say, well, that was a dumb thing to do. I didn't know that. We can change and repent. But that's not true for an angelic creature. So demons cannot repent and good angels cannot fall. Their judgment has now taken place. But again, the devil would want humanity to join him in his rebellion against God. It's the notion that misery loves company. Well, for the last part of this video, let's hear Monsignor Rossetti praying for us because I think I'm going to make this a permanent feature of all my videos moving forward. Personally, I find them very helpful. Let's meditate for a moment and pray about our families. You know, family, uh, because of the, the closeness of the relationships and the importance of them, Family can be an, a wonderful source of blessing, but it also can be a real source of harm and, and hurt and wounding. And so in the liberation process, we need to heal some of those wounds so the demons have nothing to grab onto. So 
we're going to go through a very short, simple healing uh, prayer this morning to heal us of any wounds from family. So I want you to think now uh, for a moment, reflect on any wounds uh, from your family that you may have. Okay, repeat after me. In the holy name of Jesus, in the holy name of Jesus, I willingly forgive the following people. people. I forgive any harm done by my mother or father. Any step parents, brothers or sisters, anyone in the extended family. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, I forgive them all, I forgive them all, and ask God to bless them. In Jesus' name, I willingly forgive them all, and I ask God to bless them. Once more, I forgive them all from my heart, Forgive them all of my heart. I ask God to bless them. I ask God to bless them. And for ourselves, I willingly forgive myself. I accept God's forgiveness. I accept God's forgiveness. I ask God to bless me. Now I'll say, In the holy name of Jesus, by authority given by the church, I witness your forgiveness of family members and self. May the blood of Jesus wash over you all, healing, purifying, sanctifying, bring a deep, deep sense of healing and peace. In the name of Jesus, be healed. Name of Jesus, be at peace. And now I want us all to lift up any specific wounds that we might have. There may be wounds of uh, abuse, uh, resulting addiction, uh, food addictions, alcohol, any sort of uh, negative self uh, thoughts. Uh, We're going to lift all these wounds up and ask the Lord for healing. So now think about any wounds that you have from uh, childhood and we're going to offer them up. Okay, repeat after me in the holy name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I lift up. All my wounds, I lift up all my wounds, and ask Jesus to heal them. I especially lift up the wounds of, and you can mention them now, addictions, depressions, negative self-image, all those. In the name of Jesus, may they all be healed. In the name of Jesus, May I be at peace. And I'll say, in the holy name of Jesus, I ask the blood of Jesus to wash over you, healing, purifying, sanctifying, dissolving these wounds from the past, bring a deep, deep sense of inner healing and peace. Name of Jesus, may you be healed. Name of Jesus, may you be at peace. Now I want to lift up any uh, curses or or uh, negative uh, actions against you or anyone in your family. So, in the holy name of Jesus, I lift any curses, packs, spells, seals, hexes, vexes, triggers, trances, fouls, demonic, busting, demonic, any sort of occult action sent against you or your family line. May these generational curses be lifted, uh, known or unknown. Any uh, curses of Freemasonry, especially any curses in the family. I lift these curses. I wash you clean in the blood of the Lamb. You are set free in your entire generational line, set free. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. And now finally, one more prayer, a prayer for God's love. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would love each person as you do. Wrap your arms around each one of them. May they know that they are loved. They are willed into existence by love. They have inestimable value in your sight. They are loved. They are wanted. 
They are called to your side, to your heart, to live at peace. May the love of Christ wash over you and fill you all. May you know that you are beloved sons and daughters. May your hearts be full of love and peace. And may Almighty God bless you all, now and always. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in God's peace. Well, that is all for this video. Thank you so much for being here, for your time, your support, and I can't thank you enough. For any of you who'd like to support our works, I left a link to our PayPal donation, and any amount of contribution is very much appreciated. We're doing this full time, so it's been a really great journey of learning, discovery, and humility for us all. Again, thank you so much, and until the next video, stay safe, stay healthy, and God bless you. I learned a profound lesson about this, about the importance of having something to stand on, to believe in something with all of the, everything you got, because when you're standing on that, as Jesus says, I think in Matthew 24, build your house on rock, not on sand. The sand shifts, rock solid. So let us pray tonight that we take him at his word, that we model a life of joy, of happiness, so that people really desire to have what we have, that we may truly be lights in this world of darkness. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.